It was time for us to move on. We headed for the Alsace region of France. We took the train to Aubernay. From Aubernay, we rented bikes and pedaled to our bed and breakfast in the little town of Valf. It was a cute B&B with quiet courtyard and delicious breakfast. Early the next morning, we headed out on a bike riding tour, going to the capital of sauerkraut. We continued on our scenic bike ride to Roshan, once a Roman city and later an imperial city of the Holy Roman Empire. From there we continued on to San Nabor. We got thoroughly soaked in San Nabor after we hiked to the top of Mount Saint Odile. At Mount Saint Odile we got spectacular views all the way to Germany. Also while stationed in Val. We went to Strasbourg and enjoyed its many sights. We arrived in Aubernay by train and took bikes to our base town of Valf. Our bed and breakfast has been in the owner's family for many years and he undertook quite a restoration effort when he turned it into a chambre d'hôte over a decade ago. It has a wonderfully large and private courtyard. And spacious rooms. The town isn't what I'd call a tourist town, but it did have three restaurants for us to choose from. We rode our bikes through the farmland to do a circle around the Aubernay area. Kraudigersheim is known as the Charcroute or Sauerkraut Capital. The community hosts a sauerkraut festival on the last Sunday of September every year. Rosheim is about 7 kilometers from Aubernay. From the 14th to 17th centuries, Roshan was an imperial city of the Holy Roman Empire. The Church of St. Peter and Paul was built in the 12th century with a 14th century tower. The 17th century Old Well is great to put in your photos. Four fortified tower gates from the 13th and 14th century decorate the town. And the Maison Payen, or Pagan House, was built in 1154 and is one of the best examples of medieval architecture in Alsace. We continued on our way through wine country until we reached Saint Nabor. Then we made our way to the top of Mount Saint Odile to the convent. The convent is said to have been founded by Duke Adelric of Alsace in honor of his daughter, St. Odile, at the end of the 7th century, and it's known to have been in existence at the time of Charlemagne. It provides amazing views of the Rhine River Valley. The legend of St. Odile is fascinating. It tells how her father, the Duke, wanted nothing to do with the little baby who was born blind. Her mother had to have her sent away. When she was 12, Odile was taken to a monastery where after being baptized, she miraculously recovered her sight. Later in life, when her father became ill, Odile returned to nursing. He had Mount St. Odile constructed in her honor. We hiked down to San Nabor and got thoroughly soaked in a torrential thunderstorm. And we got on our bikes and returned to Valve. 
All was well with a plate of Bouche de Lorraine and some traditional Alsatian cooking. Around the year 1240, Aubernay got out from under monastic control to gain the status of town. This gave Aubernay legal and fiscal independence and allowed it to erect its own fortifications and hold markets and fairs. A century later, Aubernay and the nine other imperial towns of Alsace united to found the Decapola. This organization was put in place to free the town from the authority of the provost, who was the representative of the emperor, and to limit the influence of the nobles. The 16th century represented a golden age for Aubernay as the town flourished. A number of buildings and structures in town can trace their origins from this period. When the Thirty Years' War ravaged the region starting in 1618, the town was occupied and plundered. But following the Peace of Westphalia, Louis XIV annexed the ten towns of the Decapola to the Crown of France in 1679. Aubernay became a royal town, losing its autonomy. However, the 18th century marked another period of prosperity. Aubernay had over 300 master craftsmen working on 35 different trades. Over the last 200 years, Aubernay has transferred back and forth between France and Germany twice, finally remaining with France at the end of World War II. The lookout from the National Monument of the Incorporated by Force gives a panoramic view of the town, even on a cloudy day. The monument was built in memory of the 272 dead or disappeared victims of the Canton during World War II. The town well was constructed in 1579 in the Renaissance style by a team of craftsmen from Strasbourg and was originally painted. Three columns with Corinthian capitals support an octagonal canopy decorated with scriptures inspired by the New Testament. Pan de Pice is a French cake or quick bread, including rye flour, honey, and spices, and in all sauce, usually a pinch of cinnamon. Traditionally, it was sold by honey merchants. We took the train to Strasbourg to see this European capital city. It is the capital and largest city of the Grand Est region of France, and it is the official seat of the European Parliament. We entered the old city with a panoramic view from the Barrage Vauban. From here we got a good view of the medieval bridges Pont Couvert. The Pont Couvert are a set of three bridges and four towers that make up a defensive work erected in the 13th century for the city of Strasbourg. The three bridges cross the four river channels of the River Eel that flow through Strasbourg's historic Petite France Quarter. Construction of the Ponce Coubert completed in 1250, and then these bridges were covered to provide protection to the Strasbourg defenders. Today they are no longer covered. La Petite France was also known as the Tanner's Quarter. Back in the Middle Ages, this area of town was home to the city's tanners, millers, and fishermen. Today, it is one of Strasbourg's main tourist attractions. Hi.
Strasbourg is also known for its mix and coexistence of the Protestant and Catholic faiths. However, no Protestant church in the city rivals the immensity of her cathedral. Strasbourg's cathedral is the sixth tallest church in the world and the highest structure built entirely in the Middle Ages. Described by Victor Hugo as a gigantic and delicate marvel and by Goth as a sublimely towering, wide-spreading tree of God, the cathedral is visible far across the plains of the Alps and can be seen from as far as the Vosges Mountains in France and the Black Forest on the other side of the Rhine in Germany. The views from the rooftop are incredible. We made our way back to Petite France to have dinner. If you knew why it was called Petite France, you might not think it was so cute. It's not because of the architecture. The area once housed a syphilis hospital. The Germans referred to syphilis as that little French disease, thus Petite France. I had a good dinner there to finish my day all the same. We headed further south in the Alsace region to spend a few days in and around Colmar. A town of nearly 70,000 residents, it's the third largest in the Alsace. From Colmar, we took our bikes to visit two nearby towns nestled in the vineyards. Our first stop was Kienzheim. Kienzheim is still contained within the medieval walls that provided it with protection hundreds of years ago, and it's famed as the only Alsatian village which remains entirely surrounded by ramparts. Next, we rode to Kaisersburg. Kaisersburg was named as the favorite village of France in 2017. It's in a beautiful setting. We approached it riding through the vineyards, and the old castle fort on the hill gets your attention among the verdure as you approach. Once you arrive, the streets are lined with picturesque buildings. Then it was back to Colmar to enjoy dinner in the canal-infested Little Venice Quarter. It's a gorgeous, brisk, and sunny day in France. We've just rented bikes in our base city in Colmar, and today, we are taking them to Kaisersburg, renowned to be the quintessential Alsatian village. The small towns and vineyards of France are ideal for bicycle riding. There are numerous and well-maintained bicycle paths throughout France, and many of the roads that we are using today are only lightly traveled by car. In addition to seeing Kaisersburg today, we're going to have another surprise. We don't know it yet, but we are going to stumble upon the charming hamlet of Kienzheim. Kienzheim is smaller than Kaisersburg, but as we will find, it has far fewer tourists. <laughs> Kienzheim is off the beaten track for most tourists. Many tourists venturing out this way will skip this smaller town and continue on to Kaisersburg. Well, hey, that's good for us. We can have the town practically to ourselves. It's a cute hamlet with timbered houses, cobblestone streets, and dotted with winemakers, restaurants, and an overall pleasing streetscape.
The first references to Keensheim date back to the 8th century, when it was part of an area owned by monasteries and noblemen. Keensheim then became a possession of the Counts of Lupfen and acquired the status of city. As a city, Keensheim was permitted to build ramparts to defend itself. Keensheim thrived, thanks largely to its flourishing wine trade. Keensheim was sold in the 16th century to Lazarus de Schwendi. He took up residence in the castle. In the next century, after the devastation caused by the Thirty Years' War. Keensheim then came under the tutelage and protection of the city of Colmar, up until the French Revolution. Keensheim was badly damaged during the Second World War. Today, the village thrives mostly based on the wine trade After enjoying our lunch, it was time to trek back through the village, find our bikes, and continue on through the vineyard to Kaisersburg. Of course, I had to make a little stop to taste the grapes. As we approached, we could see its famous chateau. Above Kaisersburg, the high fortress that dominates the town serves as a reminder of both its strategic importance and its warring history. Strolling the streets of Kaisersburg today, one sees a gorgeous, formerly fortified village on the Alsatian wine route. Its current population is about 2,700. The town hall was built in 1521 in a German Renaissance style. Kaisersburg's recorded history starts in 1227 when Emperor Frederick II purchased a small castle that would give the village its name, Kaisersburg, meaning the Emperor's Mountain in German. The castle was quickly expanded into one of the largest fortress systems in the region as a defense against the Duchy of Lorraine. In 1293, Kaisersburg was elevated to the rank of free imperial city under the direct control of the Holy Roman Emperor. Then, in 1354, it would become one of the ten Alsatian cities and towns forming the Decapola Alliance, which would last until 1679, with a brutal annexation of Alsace to France by Louis XIV. Today, tourists flock to the town and ogle at the delicious confections offered in the Alsatian Biscuitery and stroll its cobbled streets with brightly painted buildings.
Kaisersburg had an important strategic role as it allowed the emperor to close off one of the routes across the Vosges Mountains toward Lorraine. The circular keep is the oldest part of the castle and one of the first of its type in the Upper Rhine Valley. The first curtain wall which included the keep was replaced after 1261 by a wall enclosing the keep according to a contemporary plan which allowed an uninterrupted circuit of walls and strengthened defenses on the sides most likely to be attacked in the 14th century. The castle was the residence of the imperial provost or bailiff, the local representative of the emperor himself. It still has commanding views of the town and its vineyards. The castle is largely built from black granite and stands at a height of 975 feet. Kaisersberg is one of the finest wine growing areas in the Alsace. The first vines were brought here in the 16th century from Hungary and wine production is still an important aspect of the town's economy today. And wines produced from the Pinot Gris variety are the local specialties. After an enjoyable afternoon, it was time to mount our bikes and say au revoir to Kaisersberg. The Colmar train station is actually from the German period of the city. At the end of the 19th century, after the defeat of the French army, Alsace-Lorraine was annexed to the German Empire. As a result, the Colmar station came under German jurisdiction and in the early 1900s it was reconstructed. Upon your arrival, you can ride a tourist train to get an introduction to Colmar. It's an easy way of exploring the town during your stay. It features a guided tour with individual headsets provided for simultaneous translation into 16 languages. The tourist train takes about 40 minutes and rotations are about every half hour. At the heart of the Alsace wine route, Colmar has a population of about 70,000 and is well located on travel routes. It remains an important city in the Alsace and a top tourist destination. The Pfister House is probably the most famous house in Colmar. It was built in 1537, as indicated by the vintage inscription on the window of the staircase turret. Although not the original owner, Francois-Jean Pfister acquired the building in 1860, and somehow it is his name that has stayed with it until today. Colmar's Little Venice District is in the Old Town and features a tranquil canal with a collection of colorfully half-timbered houses on neatly lined cobblestone streets and walkways.
Colmar was founded in the 9th century. The first mention of Colmar is in the Chronicle of the Saxon Wars of Charlemagne, Emperor of the West, from 800 to 814. Colmar was the location where the Carolingian Emperor Charles the Fat held the Diet in 884. In 1226, Comar was raised to the status of an imperial town by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. At that point, it was surrounded by defensive walls. Then, civil rights were granted to it by Rudolf of Habsburg in 1278. In the 17th century, during the Thirty Years' War, it was occupied by Sweden. Louis XIII of France took the town under his protection in 1635, and it was later officially annexed by France. Colmar was twice annexed by Germany, from 1871 to 1919, and again during World War II. Today, Colmar offers nightlife and dining opportunities that attract tourists in droves. And if you get up early in the morning, you can get to the streets and have them almost to yourself. Those empty streets and bridges make for some really beautiful, people-free pictures. Time flew, our hearts sank, and it was time to say au revoir to Colmar. We left the Alsace region for Provence. We stayed in Arles, famed for its Roman ruins and street musicians. From Arles, we could take day trips to places like Pont de Gare, see the Roman aqueduct, and mingle with other tourists. At Tarascon, we saw an impressive medieval fortress. Not everybody knows this, but Rome isn't the only city of the popes. Avignon has a papal palace and a very famous bridge. From there we headed toward the Alpil Mountains to Les Beaux, see its medieval chateau and spectacular views. time in Provence was coming to an end. We spent a final evening in Arles and then headed south toward Marseille, toward our cruise ship. Arles sits on the Rhone River, south of Lyon and north of Marseille. The Baths of Constantine are one of the first things you'll see if you walk along the river.
Arl has a comfortable, windswept feel throughout the town. We had decided to stay in town at a small B&B rather than on the outskirts at a hotel. We arrived to find children playing in the streets. We made a good choice, receiving a warm welcome. We dropped off our bags and went out to make our cursory discovery of the town. When we made it up to the Place de la République, a street musician was playing in the middle of the square. I later met the musician that I had just filmed, as he was also the brother of the owner of our B&B. Small town, small world. Looking at the weathered buildings, some with an almost desert-like appearance, you know this town is old. But actually, this town isn't just old. It's ancient. The Romans took the town in 123 BC and expanded it to be an important city, linking it to the Mediterranean Sea by a canal. But its chance to become truly famous and important in the empire came when it sided with Julius Caesar against Pompey, providing Caesar with military support. When Caesar emerged victorious from the conflict, Arlot was rewarded. Arlot, as Arl was then known, became a city of considerable importance in the province of Gallia. It would cover an area of 100 acres and possessed a number of monuments, including an amphitheater, a Roman circus, a triumphal arc, a performance theater, and a full circuit of walls. Today the city hosts shops, markets, and a plethora of restaurants to appeal to tourists and locals alike. From the end of the 15th to the middle of the 16th centuries, the city experienced a period of prosperity and important transformations. For example, in 1558, the Belfry was constructed in the city center, situated on the present-day Place de la République. At that time, Arlesian aristocracy was living in the center of the city where they built sumptuous townhomes. Numerous mansions were constructed around central courtyards with ornate decors. Classical architecture flourished in Arles with the construction of the city hall. Finished in the latter half of the 17th century. Plans were designed by Jacques Petre with input from Jules Hardouin Mansev, who was named that same year as the official architect of King Louis XIV. It was then that the Place de la République then called Place Royale, was profoundly modified. The period of reconstruction during the 17th and 18th centuries gives the city of Arles the appearance that we see today.
Like most of Provence, Arles enjoys a relatively low violent crime rate. The most common crime is theft from cars. We enjoyed several late night strolls in the city streets. This gate outside the theater was the original used by spectators in Roman times. Entry today is on the opposite side. Originally, the theater consisted of three parts. The cavia, a semicircular space for spectators, the stage where the actors played, and a wall that served as a backdrop. The cavia, with a diameter of 102 meters, could accommodate 10,000 spectators sitting on 33 rows of terraces. In Arles, the theater would have contained half as many spectators as the arena or the circus. The spectators were divided by social class, with regular people above and knights and nobles on the lower tiers with the orchestra and the theater would have been used to perform tragic and comic plays. The Arles Amphitheater, or Orendal, is a Roman amphitheater built in 90 AD. This amphitheater was capable of seating 20,000 spectators and was built to provide entertainment in the form of chariot races and bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat. Today it draws large crowds for bullfighting during the Feria d'Arl, as well as plays and concerts in summer. It's a formidable structure, and with the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century, the amphitheater became a shelter for the population and was transformed into a fortress with four towers. The structure encircled more than 200 houses, becoming a real town with a public square in the center of the arena. It also included two chapels. Its residential role continued up until the 18th century. From the top of the arena, you get good views of the nearby communities of Arles. The Elise Comps is a Roman necropolis just outside the walls of the old town of Arles. It was one of the most famous necropolises of the ancient world. The name comes from the Provençal word Alice Comp, which comes from the Latin Alice Campi. In English, that would be Elysian Fields, and in French, that would be the Champs Elysees. Roman cities traditionally had burials outside the city limits. It was therefore common for the roads immediately outside a city to be lined with tombs and mausoleums. The Alice Camps 
was Arles' main burial ground for nearly 1,500 years. It was the final segment of the Aurelian Way leading up to the city gates and was used as a burial ground for the well-off citizens, whose memorials range from simple sarcophagi to elaborate tombs. The Alice Comps continued to be used after the city was Christianized in the 4th century. The area became a highly desirable place to be buried, and tombs soon multiplied. As early as the 4th century, there were already several thousand tombs necessitating the stacking of sarcophagi, three layers deep. Burial in the Alice Comps became so desirable that bodies were shipped from all over Europe. Roan boatmen made a healthy profit transporting coffins to Arles. One of Arles' most famed residents was Vincent van Gogh. We enjoyed a guided walking tour, starting near the then hospital grounds where Vincent had been a resident after his famous ear incident. These postcards display some of the numerous paintings and drawings that Vincent made in and around Arles. He developed an expressive individual painting style characterized by bold color and dynamic brush strokes. Vincent arrived in Arles in 1888. When he got there, he took up residence at the hotel restaurant Carrel, and later he took up residence at the Café de la Guerre. He then moved to the Yellow House, which he had begun using as a studio. We strolled through the city, following a marked trail and seeing signs indicating known and potential locations for many of Vincent's Impressionist paintings. Pont du Gard is the most famous of all Roman aqueducts. We decided to take a canoe trip down the Gardon River to eventually go under the Pont to experience this major Roman aqueduct from below. The Pont was built to carry water to the Roman city of Nimes. On this day, we were not alone. We saw dozens upon dozens of people on the banks, and swimming in the river, enjoying it. We saw even more as we got closer to the pond. In ancient times, the Pont du Gard carried 9 million gallons of water a day to the fountains, baths, and homes of the citizens of Nîmes. As you get nearer to the pont, it gets harder to stick your oar in the water without hitting another boat or a swimmer. It is massive as you gaze up at it from below. and the 
teens jumping from the rock ledges above love to jump as close to your boat as they can to get you good and wet. From Pont de Garde, we return home to Arles via Tarascon. The construction of the castle at Tarascon was started in 1401 by Louis II of Anjou. It was continued by his first son Louis III of Anjou and completed in 1449 by his second son René I of Naples. Thus the castle is often called King René's Castle. You enter the chateau by a bridge crossing the moat. It's an imposing sentinel. The chateau rises up 45 meters and is subdivided into two parts. To the north, the outer courtyard is for the commoners, and the south has the lordly apartments. Upon the death of René's heir, Charles de Man, the earldom of Provence was ceded to Louis XI, King of France. The fortress lost its strategic interest at that time. Across the river is Beaucaire, an important site in the conflict with the Cathars. From the 1200s, this castle was among the earliest to fall under the control of the kings of France. It was thus fortified to maintain royal dominance over the Rhone River. Avignon's current walls date back to the 14th century, with portions dating to the 12th century and even earlier times. Pope Innocent VI began their construction in 1355. The Pope judged it necessary in this period when the Rhone Valley swarmed with highway robber bands during his Avignon Papacy. The Avignon Papacy was a period from 1309 to 1376, during which seven consecutive popes resided in Avignon in the Kingdom of Arles, which was at that time part of the Holy Roman Empire. The situation arose from a conflict between the papacy and the King of France, culminating in the death of Pope Boniface VIII after his arrest and maltreatment by Philip IV of France. Then, Following the death of Pope Benedict XI, Philip forced a deadlock conclave of cardinals to elect the French Clement V as Pope in 1305. Clement set up his court in the papal enclave at Avignon, where it remained for 67 years. During this time, the popes would build and rule from a palace fortress in Avignon. Their palace consisted of two joined buildings. The older palace of Benedict XII, which sits on the impregnable Rock of Domes, and the newer palace of Clement VI, the most extravagant of all the Avignon popes. Together, these structures form the largest Gothic building of the Middle Ages. Among the famed events that occurred in the Papal Palace was the trial of Queen Joanna of Naples, accused of murdering her husband and marrying another, 
She was acquitted by Pope Clement VI and given aid to restore her to her throne in Naples. The upper levels of the palace give great views. From here, we could see the Musée de Petit Palais, which is a museum and art gallery clearly visible from the palace. It has an exceptional collection of Renaissance paintings of the Avignon School as well as from Italy and dates back to the Avignon Papacy. The Cathedral of Avignon sits next to the palace. The most notable feature of the cathedral is the gilded statue of the Virgin Mary. From the palace, you can even gain a glimpse of the Pont d'Avignon. After a bite, we continued up the Rocher du Dom. From this hilltop, where the church and palace reside, is also a park. The park gives great views of the surrounding area, including Fort André across the River Rhone, and of course the famous Pont d'Avignon. Beginning in 1234, a bridge, the Pont d'Avignon, was rebuilt with 22 stone arches. It was abandoned then in the 17th century as the arches suffered severe damage every time the Rhone River flooded, making it very expensive to maintain. However, four arches still remain and a gatehouse at the Avignon end of the bridge. The chapel of St. Nicholas sits on the second pier of the bridge. The bridge's other name is the St. Benazé Bridge. A local shepherd boy, as legend has it, was inspired to build the bridge as while he was tending his flock, the voice of Jesus asked him to construct this bridge across the river. On our way back to Arles, we stopped to see Les Beaux de Provence. In the Middle Ages, the area became the stronghold of a feudal domain covering about 80 towns and villages. The fortress at this site was built between the 11th and 13th centuries. To get to the historic fortress site, you have to cross through the town itself. Access through the town and the fort site is only permitted by foot. A memorial to Charlene Leu, a French farmer and poet, sits on the plateau overlooking the olive groves. Here we are situated in the heart of the Alpilles on a rocky plateau, 245 meters high. We have a magnificent view of Arles, Camarogue, and the Alpilles from several stunning lookout points.
The rugged princes of Beauce controlled Provence for many years, and they gained a formidable reputation. They claimed to be descended from the biblical magi Balthazar, and their coat of arms was a silver star with 16 branches, a reminder that according to the gospel, it guided the three wise men to Bethlehem. Their motto was Ohazar Balthazar, at luck, at random, Balthazar. As a medieval stronghold on the borders of the Languedoc, Comtat, and Provence, the fortress had an active military history and had been the subject of many assaults. The solid dungeon still dominates the village today and reiterates the importance of this castle, which was a desirable possession in the Middle Ages. At the end of the Bosonique Wars in the 12th century, the princes of Bose were defeated. This meant change for the region. The large castle began to be renowned for its highly cultivated court and chivalrous conduct. The estate finally came to an end in the 15th century after the death of the last Prince of Bose. We conclude our trip to Le Beaux with a casual walk down the cobbled streets past its enticing shops and restaurants. Would you like to see Alpine beauty, both expansive and small? Maybe you'd like to fall in love with the storybook charms of the Alsace. How about peering through a medieval window onto a plain of vineyards and olive groves? We could frolic in Provençal streets by day and wander them in tranquility at night. When we get tired, we can count chamois. You see, we don't have to count sheep. We could count anything we want, like waterfalls or mountaintops that reach above the clouds. We could see Italian Renaissance palaces inside and out, and ancient ruins who mingle among the centuries of architecture. We'll discover Mediterranean islands where Norman and Arab influences collide and combine. What are we waiting for? Let's fill our water bottles and grab a snack and stuff it in our knapsack. Let's get to our feet and see the sights. Sometimes we'll be walking on the edge of the world. But don't worry, all our travels won't be on foot. We'll take trains and we'll see incredible vistas as we travel to our destinations. We'll take cable cars and gondolas up and down mountains for a thrilling, suspenseful ride. We'll take horse and carriage on cobblestone streets, and maybe even a horseless carriage. We'll take boats. We'll paddle small ones down rivers and under aqueducts. We'll take medium-sized ones across lakes and we'll take large ones 
the hop between islands of the sea. And of course, I always love to ride my bike through vineyard and village. Let's go! We'll travel to great places, experience them and turn them inside out and upside down. We'll explore our tiny planet and have an incredible time. Together, we will conquer the world.